House manager's presentation, everything that happened here at the Capitol on January 6th, uh, and of course had to sit in the chamber to see pictures of it having been ransacked uh, while they sat at their very desks. But again, this announcement from McConnell uh, likely really uh, closes any window that there may have been uh, or idea that, that uh, former President Trump might be uh, convicted, Joe. The other thing I will add is uh, that we're dealing with this morning is, uh, and there's Mitch McConnell now walking uh, from his office to the Senate floor, uh, we are dealing uh, with a question about witnesses uh, yes. because of some new information Senators, that came out uh, overnight uh, from Kevin McCarthy. So we're about to find out right now uh, if something unexpected is going to happen on that front. Yeah, that no is objection. sort of the big no question objection. that remains this morning. Will we see witnesses? If we don't have witnesses, how do we expect things to move forward today? Uh, so I think they're about to make the proclamation, Joe. I think we ought to just listen in here uh, because if this starts as quickly as we expect, we're going to go straight to these uh, final closing arguments and then, of course, uh, to the final vote. Uh, Donald John Trump. Joe former president of the United States. And pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 47, the Senate has provided up to two hours of argument by the parties, equally divided, on the question of whether or not it shall be in order to consider and debate under the impeachment rules any motion to subpoena witnesses or documents. Are both parties ready to proceed at this point? They may proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, Senators. Um, over the last several days, we presented overwhelming evidence that establishes the charges in the article of impeachment. We've shown you how President Trump created a powder keg, lit a match, and then continued his incitement even, even as he failed to defend us from the ensuing violence. We've supported our position with images, videos, affidavits, documents, tweets, and other evidence, leaving no doubt that the Senate should convict. We believe we've proven our case. But last night, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler of Washington State issued a statement confirming that in the middle of the insurrection, when House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy called the president to beg for help, President Trump responded, and I quote, well, Kevin, I guess these people are more upset about the election than you are. Needless to say, this is uh, an additional critical piece of corroborating evidence, further confirming the charges before you, as well as the president's willful um, dereliction of duty and desertion of duty as commander in chief of the United States, his state of mind, and his further incitement of the insurrection on January 6th. For that reason, and because this is the proper time to do so under the resolution that the Senate adopted to set the rules for the trial, we would like the opportunity to subpoena Congresswoman Herrera regarding her communications with House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and to subpoena her contemporaneous notes that she made regarding what President Trump told Kevin McCarthy in the middle of the insurrection. We would be prepared to proceed by Zoom deposition of an hour or less, just as soon as Congresswoman Herrera Butler is available and to then proceed to the next phase of the trial, including the introduction of that testimony shortly thereafter. Congresswoman Butler further stated that she hopes other witnesses to this part of the story, other patriots, as she put it, would come forward. And if that happens, we would seek the opportunity to take their depositions via Zoom also for less than an hour or to subpoena other relevant documents as well. Council. President, thank you. Senators, good morning. Uh, and good morning to the American people. The first thing I want to say on the issue of witnesses is that the House manager just got up here and described the articles of impeachment and the charges. There is no plural here. That's wrong. There's one article of impeachment 
and there's one charge, and that's incitement of violence and insurrection. What you all need to know and the American people need to know is as of late yesterday afternoon, there was a stipulation going around that there weren't going to be any witnesses. But after what happened here in this chamber yesterday, the House managers realized they did not investigate this case before bringing the impeachment. They did not give the proper uh, uh, consideration and work. They didn't put the work in that was necessary to impeach the former president. But if they want to have witnesses, I'm going to need at least over a hundred depositions, not just one. The real issue is incitement. They put, put into their case over a hundred witnesses, people who have been charged with crimes by the federal government. And each one of those, they said that Mr. Trump was a co-conspirator with. That's not true. But I have the right to defend that. The only thing that I ask, if you vote for witnesses, do not handcuff me by limiting the number of witnesses that I can have. I need to do a thorough investigation that they did not do. I need to do the 911 style investigation that Nancy Pelosi called for. It should have been done already. It's a dereliction of the house manager's duty that they didn't. And now at the last minute after a stipulation had apparently been worked out, they want to go back on that. I think that's inappropriate and improper. We should close this case out today. We have each prepared our closing arguments. We each, I mean, I had eight days to get ready for this thing, but we each had those eight days equally together to prepare ourselves. And the House managers need to live with the case that they brought. But if they don't, please, in all fairness and in all due process, do not limit my ability to discover, discover, discover the truth. That would be another sham. And that's the president's position, my position. I should just have it standing by its distance. Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, this is the proper time that we were assigned to talk about witnesses. This is completely within the course of the rules set forth by the Senate. There's nothing remotely unusual about this. I think we've done an ex exceedingly thorough and comprehensive job with all the evidence that was available last night. This was breaking news, and it responded directly to a question that was being raised by the President's Defense Council, saying that we had not sufficiently proven to their satisfaction, although I think we've proven to the satisfaction of the American people certainly, that the president, after the breach and the invasion took place, was not working on the side of defending the Capitol, but rather was continuing to pursue his political goals. And the information that came out last night by Congresswoman Butler, apparently backed up by contemporaneous notes that she had taken, I think will put to rest any lingering doubts raised by the President's counsel, who now says he wants to interview hundreds of people. There's only one person the President's counsel really needs to interview, and that's their own client. And bring him forward, as we suggested last week, because a lot of this is uh, matters that are in his head. Well, why did he not act to defend the country after he learned of the attack? Why was he continuing to press the political case? But this piece of evidence is relevant to that. And uh, finally, uh, but I, I, wasn't, I, I was 
a little bit mystified by the point about the article of impeachment, which I uh, referred to. Um, the dereliction of duty, the desertion of duty, is built into the incitement charge, obviously. If the President of the United States is out inciting a violent insurrection, he's obviously not doing his job at the same time. Just like if a police officer is mugging you, yeah, he's guilty of theft and armed robbery, whatever it might be, but he's also not doing his job as a police officer, so it's further evidence of his intent and what his conduct is. If I may. Counsel? First of all, it's my understanding, it's been reported uh, that um, Mr. McCarthy disclaims the rumors that have been the basis of this morning's antics, but really the rumors that have been the basis of this entire proceeding. This entire proceeding is based on rumor, report, innuendo. There's nothing to it, and they didn't do their work. Just like what happened with Mr. Lee two or three nights ago, some supposed conversation had happened, and they had to withdraw that. They had to back off of that because it was false. It was a false narrative. But it is one article of impeachment. Yeah, they threw a lot of stuff in it in violation of Rule 23. Rule 23 says you cannot combine counts. It's a defect in their entire case. It's one of the four reasons why you can vote to acquit in this case. Jurisdiction, Rule 23, due process, and the First Amendment. They all apply in this case. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me take my own advice and cool the temperature in the room a little bit. It's about the incitement. It's not about what happened afterwards. That's actually the irrelevant stuff. That's the irrelevant stuff. It's not the things that were said from the election to January 6th. It's not relevant to the legal analysis of the issues that are before this body. It doesn't matter what happened after the insurgents into the Capitol building because that doesn't have to do with incitement. Incitement, is a, is a, it's, it's a point in time, folks. It's a point in time when the words are spoken and the words say, implicitly say, explicitly say, commit acts of violence or lawlessness. And we don't have that here. So for the house managers to say we ne need depositions about things that happened after, it's not, just not true. But, but if he does, there are a lot of depositions that need to be happened. Nancy Pelosi's deposition needs to be taken. Come, uh, uh, Vice President uh, Harris's uh, deposition absolutely needs to be taken, and not by Zoom. None of these depositions should be done by Zoom. We didn't do this hearing by Zoom. These depositions should be done in person, in my office, in Philadelphia. That's where they should be done. I don't know how many civil lawyers are here, but that's the way it works, folks. When you want somebody's deposition, you send a notice of deposition, and they appear at the place where the notice says. That's civil process. I don't know why you're laughing. It is civil process. That is the way lawyers do it. We send notices of deposition. In the I, notice I would, of- I would remind everybody that we will have order yeah. in I, I don't the- have chamber if you, during these proceedings. I haven't laughed at any of you, and there's nothing laughable here. He mentioned my client 
coming in to testify. That is not the way it's done. If he wanted to talk to Donald Trump, he should have put a subpoena down, like I'm gonna slap subpoenas on a good number of people. If witnesses are what re is required here for them to try to get their case back in order, which has failed miserably for four reasons. There is no jurisdiction here. There has been no due process here. They have completely violated and ignored and stepped on the Constitution of the United States. They have trampled on it like people who have no respect for it. And if this is about nothing else, it has to be about the respect of our country, our Constitution, and all of the people that make it up. And so that I ask when considering or voting on this um, witness matter, and to be clear, this may be the time to do it, but again, and everybody needs to know, that the backroom politics, I'm not so much into it all, and I'm not too adept at it neither. But there was a stipulation. They felt pretty comfortable after day two until their case was tested on day three. Now is the time to end this. Now is the time to hear the closing arguments. Now is the time to vote your conscience. Thank you. Mr. Raskin. We were involved in no discussions about a stipulation, um, and I have no further comment. Thank you, Mr. President. position on that. I would remind, I would remind everybody, as Chief Justice Roberts noted on January 21st, 2020, citing the trial of Charles Swain in 1905, all parties in this chamber must refrain from using language that is not conducive to civil discourse. Um, I listened to Chief Justice Roberts say that. I agreed with him. And I thought for our colleagues, I would repeat it as I did last night. So the question we have before us is whether it shall be in order to consider and debate under the rules of impeachment any motion to subpoena witnesses or documents. The request for the yeas and nays has been made. Is there a sufficient second? There appears to be there is. The clerk will call the roll. <clears throat> Ms. Baldwin. <clears throat> Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. For those tuning in this morning and expecting to see perhaps three to four hours of closing arguments in the impeachment trial and then a vote, perhaps a curveball has been thrown this morning. We see that the House impeachment managers now want to subpoena and depose Representative Jamie Herrera Butler after developments that came in overnight. Let's go right to Capitol Hill, NBC's Casey Hunt. So Casey, maybe walk us through the developments we've seen here in the last few minutes and what we're seeing right now, what this vote is right now and how things might move forward. So uh, Joe, I actually am very interested to hear what we're actually getting from the senators on this vote. This is a very unexpected Mr. development, Casey. big picture. Uh, we had not yeah. thought that there were going to be witnesses called in this trial. Both sides seemed Ms. ready Collins. to wrap it up. And in fact, there had been an expectation uh, that even by this afternoon, uh, it was possible that they would be holding a final Mr. vote Cornyn. here. 
but instead something that played out last night has caught Mastow. the attention of the House impeachment managers. And it's questions Mr. about Cotton. a phone call that Mr. the uh, House minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, Mr. made Cripo. to President Trump on the day of January 6th. Mr. And Cripo. Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Boitler, who uh, was one of those uh, who voted to impeach President Trump. She's a more moderate uh, member of the Mr. House Duckworth. Republican Conference uh, that, of course, uh, handled Durbin. this initial impeachment proceeding, Mr. put out Ernst. a very unusual Ms. statement uh, last night where she said she essentially uh, disputed the idea that former Mrs. President Fisher. Trump was not aware that people were in danger. Uh, used, uh, there were expletives used in this Mr. phone Graham. call, and she says that if anyone else has additional information Mr. about Grassley. this, to come forward with it now would be the time. Mr. And Haggerty. so what the House managers have said after He's some passing. significant pressure uh, from particularly uh, progressives and liberals You're online, but also some members of the body, uh, including some people like uh, Senator Angus Hooper. King, who is uh, not necessarily considered to be one of the more uh, liberal or, or fire-throwing members of the uh, Democratic caucus. He's actually Smith. officially an independent. Uh, have Mr. said that, well, perhaps there should be more information heard here. Mr. So Johnson. right now they're voting on whether or not to call those witnesses. Mr. And like King. I said, uh, we're going to have to listen carefully to the vote count because we really don't know what's going to happen here and how this is going to play out. Now, the lead impeachment manager, Jamie Raskin, said King. at the top of this that they want to do a very fast deposition, one hour on Zoom, which Mr. suggests Langford. perhaps they're still trying to turn it around Mr. today. Like I said, there has Mr. been a real interest in not letting this trial drag out uh, for days or weeks because everyone wants to move on. Republicans want to stop Thomas. talking about the former president. Mr. Democrats Mr. want to get on with Mr. passing Martin. Joe Biden's, current president Joe Biden's agenda. So Mr. the Mr. outcome Mr. of this vote is going to be critical because it's going to say Mr. whether Mr. or not uh, there is, in fact, another Markley. piece of this trial and, and raise all of these questions about how to handle that. It's Mr. not Mr. impossible Mr. that we could still uh, finish this weekend Mr. if, Mr. in Murphy. fact, they do call witnesses, but it Mrs. would be a pretty Murphy. unusual step. And again, uh, just Ossoff. to underscore for our viewers, Mr. we were Padilla. not expecting any of this to happen, so we're Mr. watching Paul. it. Uh, right along with everybody else and trying to report it out uh, in real time, Mr. Joe. Peters. That's exactly the case. Let's bring in White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, who is also watching this. And I'm guessing we don't have a response at this Mr. moment Rich. from President Biden, but we know that Mr. the president Romney. wanted this Senate trial to move as quickly as possible so he could focus on his COVID Rouse. agenda and sort of moving the country forward. Can, do we have any idea or insight on, on how the president and the White House might be Mr. responding Sanders. to what we're seeing unfold this morning? Morning. Well, to set expectations, let's move the bar down because Mr. President Shots. Biden is not expected to weigh in on Mr. this. Schumer. And top officials have told us that they have not Scott been coordinating Florida. with any of the Scott, uh, Democrats South on Carolina. Capitol Hill about these Mr. issues Mr. that are unfolding in front of us about the matter Mr. of Shelby. witnesses or the impact on how it could delay. Having said that, there's also Ms. been Minima. no secret about where President Biden stands. He would like to be focused on Ms. his Shabna. own first 100 days, not a second trial of Donald Trump. And to do that, he needs the attention of senators, House members too, to deal with things Mr. like Tillis. COVID relief and the urgencies that surround that. Now there is a some, somewhat of an ability Mr. to Tuberville. walk and chew gum on Capitol Hill, but Mr. let's Mr. be Van honest Hall. about how an impeachment trial takes the oxygen Warner. and the political muscle and directs Warner. it back to this set of events and not so much on Ms. what Warren. President Biden wants to do. He is at Camp David this White weekend, House. his first time there as president, and we expect that Mr. what Wicker. he would want to see out of this Mr. is Wyden. to watch these senators vote uh, their conscience, Mr. and Young. he said he's very curious to see how they will handle this, but pointing out he's no longer a member of the Senate. Joe? We are. We are getting to the end of the alphabet right now. Senators are voting on whether to call witnesses, which means a whole new phase of this trial would begin. And we're still uncertain exactly how that would unfold. But let's take a listen in right now to see if we have the final vote tally.
Senators voting in the affirmative. Baldwin, Bennett, Blumenthal, Booker, Brown, Cantwell, Cardin, Carper, Casey, Collins, Coons, Cortez Masto, Duckworth, Durbin, Feinstein, Gillibrand, Hassan, Heinrich, Hickenlooper, Hirono, Kane, Kelly, King, Klobuchar, Leahy, Lujan, Manchin, Markey, Menendez, Merkley, Murkowski, Murphy, Murray, Ossoff, Padilla, Peters, Reed, Romney, Rosen, Sanders, Sass, Schatz, Schumer, Shaheen, Cinema, Smith, Stabenow, Tester, Van Hollen, Warner, Warnock, Warren, White House, Wyden. Senators voting in the negative. Barrasso, Blackburn, Blunt, Bozeman, Braun, Burr, Capito, Cassidy, Cornyn, Cotton, Kramer, Crapo, Cruz, Danes, Ernst, Fisher, Graham, Grassley, Haggerty, Hawley, Hoven, Hydesmith, Inhofe, Johnson, Kennedy, Lankford, Lee, Lummis, Marshall, McConnell, Moran, Paul, Portman, Risch, Rounds, Rubio, Scott of Florida, Scott of South Carolina, Shelby, Sullivan, Thune, Tillis, Toomey, Tuberville, Wicker, Young. Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to change my vote to aye. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, aye. <clears throat> Mr. President. Mr. Sullivan. Just a point of inquiry. There's a little confusion here. Was that a vote on uh, one witness the debate, or many debate, witnesses? Debate is not allowed during the vote. I advise the not debate. It's Senator a point from of Alaska. Inquiry. Mr. President, it's a point of inquiry on what we just voted on. Uh, that is, uh, I'm I advised that is not allowed during the vote. Immediately before we start to cast. The uh, points of order and debate are not allowed during the vote. That is established Senate procedure that we always follow. You're watching right now as senators vote on whether to call witnesses in this impeachment trial. Clearly a little bit of confusion on the Senate floor with one senator just asking, what did we just vote on? Let's bring in Casey Hunt. Casey, maybe you can help answer that question. What did they just vote on? <laughs> I'm going to do my best, Joe. Um, and forgive me, I'm going to keep an ear on the floor because if they start talking, I'm going to let our viewers in 
uh, on that. But essentially, our understanding of the rules is that they just had a majority vote on whether calling any witness would be in order in the trial. So a broad, okay, do we want to consider calling specific witnesses? Our question, and we believe what would happen next, is that there would be a vote on a specific witness to call. Now, we know that, that Jamie Raskin said in his remarks he wants to call Congresswoman Herrera Beutler, uh, who, of course, is one of those uh, House Republicans who voted to impeach Donald Trump and who has relayed new details of a call between the House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and Donald Trump on January 6th. So uh, there was some open confusion on the floor uh, with one senator, uh, Dan Sullivan of Alaska, asking what they had just voted on. That was after Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, obviously a very staunch ally of the former president, changed his vote to yes. On Let's the listen. question of whether it shall be in order to consider and debate under the rules of of impeachment any motion to subpoena witnesses or documents. The motion is agreed to by a vote of 55 to 45. Majority Leader. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin. All right, Casey, we'll let you kind of pick up there. We know that there was a 55-45 vote. So what was it that happened and and what's next here? Sure. So you heard uh, Senator Leahy there presiding. Uh, He has said uh, or, or he outlined that there were 55 senators who voted that, yes, they would like to allow the Senate to call to vote on calling witnesses in the trial, that motions to call certain witnesses are going to be in order. And you saw Five Republicans vote with Democrats, uh, and those uh, are five Republicans. uh, Four of them we had expected to likely vote to convict Donald Trump. Now, Lindsey Graham, who's the fifth one on there, changed his vote at the last second. We were just uh, talking about that to say that, yes, witnesses should be called. Remember, the, the fifth vote to say the trial was constitutional was Senator Pat Toomey. Toomey voted no on the witness question. So that's that's a little bit of an interesting uh, discrepancy. But big picture here and what you're seeing now on the Senate floor, they've gone into what's called a quorum call. And it sounds like they're about to start to call the roll where they read the names alphabetically. They're just trying to buy time to figure out what's going on is what's happening here. Uh, This is a a mechanism that they use to pause business on the floor to allow senators to talk among themselves. Because one of the very strange uh, rules, unusual rules about impeachment trials is that senators are actually not allowed to speak. So that's why earlier you saw the senator who was trying to ask, what did we just vote on, uh, be shut down, essentially, because they are not allowed to talk under those conditions. So putting the Senate into this procedural situation allows them to then talk among themselves, figure out what happens next and what's going on. So again, Joe, let's just reset a little bit, pull back, because when you and I sat down here to start this trial today, covering this trial, we fully expected that this was going to last from about 10 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon, maybe a couple of hours later, as both sides wrapped up their arguments, uh, as Republicans uh, were on track to acquit President Trump. Remember Mitch McConnell sending a letter this morning, uh, just a few hours ago, honestly, or not even, uh, to say that he plans to vote to acquit former President Trump. And you're seeing him there on the floor talking with Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, uh, who is one of these uh, swing votes. That's also Roy Blunt, who's next to him. He's a member of the leadership team. Uh, I'm I'm learning how to tell senators from the the hairlines on the back of their heads. I think (laughs) that's Senator Wicker uh, down front next to Lisa Murkowski, but it's a little tough to tell with the masks. They're clearly having a conversation about what is going to happen next. So it's clear that the, the reality that we have been facing this entire time, that, that Republicans in the Senate were on track to acquit former President Donald Trump of incitement of insurrection, that is true. Uh, the, the, the final nail uh, on that came this morning with that McConnell letter. There may have been, we thought, up to five who might have followed him had he been willing to say that he wanted to convict former President Trump, and he had left the door open. Uh, He had not said one way or the other. Uh, He had said he wanted to hear all of the evidence. Uh, But he came out this morning, I think, 
along with the rest of us, thinking that we were about to conclude this. He was ready to make his, make his news, so to speak, uh, in the context of this trial. But that now has been thrown uh, into some chaos. And the reason for this, again, is this, this phone call and, and what we need to know about this phone call. And there clearly were five Republicans willing to say, OK, yeah, I want to know more about this phone call. So the next step here on the floor, and uh, we'll see how quickly they get to it, because they're clearly, uh, as you can see, still trying to figure things out. But the proposal from the House managers is to subpoena uh, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Boitler. She put out, as we were discussing earlier, this extraordinarily unusual statement last night. And you know, I'm not sure if, if our control room uh, has a copy of that statement that we could show uh, people. But uh, if there's somebody back there who's able to create one, it's the very last line of that statement where she says, if anyone has any more information about this call, now is the time to say so. And obviously, the people on that call, Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, and former President Trump. And according to a CNN report that was later confirmed uh, by our colleagues, my colleague Alex Moe and others uh, on our Hill team, uh, the expletives were used. And Donald Trump suggested that Kevin McCarthy uh, did not care as much as the people who were attacking the Capitol about what happened in the election. Now, obviously, that's an explosive claim because it suggests Donald Trump was aware of the attacks, had been told how bad it was, had been told how much danger that people were in, uh, and that there was something that the president could have done about it. So I, I think we have Kelly O'Donnell with us, too, at the White House. Uh, Kelly, a, a, a couple of questions for you. Uh, president, there's obviously two presidents that you've covered, former President Trump. Now you're covering President Biden. And I think there are threads to pull on from each. I mean, first of all, what do we know about what the president's team is saying and doing behind the scenes, what they're saying about that phone call? And then we also have to assume that the White House, the current White House, was read in on this strategy from the House managers. So we'd love to hear you talk about their reaction to what's unfolding here as well. Well, the Biden team, Casey, says it is not coordinating with the House managers and Democrats on Capitol Hill. That is separate than being in the loop and informed, of course. And it is certainly in President Biden's interest to put this behind him in order to have the focus be on his own agenda, his own time in office, his own priorities. So there is a divide there because there are certainly many Democrats, many supporters of President Biden who want accountability against his predecessor, Donald Trump. And then when you consider what's happening in the Trump world now, now that this vote has been taken. I, I noticed, and you may have seen it as well, out of the corner of uh, looking at that Senate floor that we both know so well, Rand Paul came up to the defense counsel. Uh, there was also a note exchanged on the defense counsel side and a young woman there walking away. Uh, I half wonder if it isn't a place a phone call to our client kind of moment, meaning to Florida. And we believe that former President Trump is at his West Palm Beach golf club uh, today. That doesn't mean he's golfing. He often spends time in the clubhouse there, has meetings and phone calls as uh, the term of art in the Trump years uh, would go. Uh, so he may be informed. Also, other aides to former President Trump are on uh, the, the Capitol grounds with you who are in that separate room where they've been meeting. So part of what may be playing out here, and I think part of the question of the Graham vote switch, is can they own witnesses as well? Meaning, can they embrace the idea of witnesses in order to get what they would want from the Trump defense? An opportunity, as we heard uh, Council Vanderveen talk about, uh, wanting to depose Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, about decisions she may have made related to security of the Capitol. A whole list of things that could effectively gum up the works and also distract and deflect from any culpability of President Trump. What's so notable about the phone calls that have come to the fore, Casey, as you well understand, we knew about these phone calls weeks ago, but new dimensions of what was discussed is what has come forward. In addition to the McCarthy call, Tommy Tuberville, a new senator from Alabama, one of the closest allies of Donald Trump in the Senate, received a call during the events of January 6th that uh, we believe was the president trying to get him to forestall the certification. And last night, as you know, Tuberville, again, a Trump ally, affirmed that, yes, in fact, he had informed President Trump that Vice President Mike Pence was removed from the chamber. Uh, that would only happen in a moment of peril. So the notion 
presented by the Trump defense that Mr. Trump did not know there was danger to Mike Pence has very strong contradictory evidence from a friend of the president. That combined with no greater ally in the House uh, than Kevin McCarthy to Donald Trump during most of his time in office. Uh, and to have a phone call where sort of a consciousness, a state of mind of Donald Trump uh, is reflected in the notes taken by the Congresswoman who is the subject of this witness issue. And her knowledge of what was said at the time, a heated exchange, uh, where President Trump is uh, quoted to have said to McCarthy that the people involved in the insurrection uh, were more yes. concerned about uh, the election than McCarthy. And then as the reporting goes, uh, that McCarthy fired back at him, uh, who do you think you're talking to with some salty language? So this isn't a case where Democrats are bringing new evidence. This is a case where we're seeing new developments coming from Republican allies of Donald Trump that directly relates to what he was thinking, what he knew, what he was aware of as the insurrection was happening. It seems very much probative, uh, germane to what's going on here. And the big question is, how much of the valuable resource of time is the Senate willing to commit to this? And as Casey, as you understand, that's one of the questions we're waiting to better understand. What will happen? We've got a left turn happening. You and I are on that ride together and where it goes uh, is a question mark right now. Casey? That's for sure, uh, Kelly. And I think we can send it back uh, to Joe Fryer, uh, who's got a guest on set with him, Joe. Yeah, we know, Casey and Kelly, you'll be standing by on pins and needles as we wait to answer some of these key questions. Right now, we do want to bring in NBC News legal analyst Carol Lamb, a former U.S. attorney. So, Carol, uh, we expect in a criminal trial that we would have witnesses. We weren't expecting them in this trial. Now that might change your reaction so far to the developments that we're seeing this morning. Yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, the House managers had to really balance their roles as uh, a lot of them were former prosecutors, but they're all now uh, representatives as well. And so the political and the legal are, are really in attention here. Uh, it's fascinating because their most relevant probative witnesses are the people who are closest to the president because they are the people who, who the pre president reached out to as the riot was going on. And, you know, it's probative for two reasons. One is that uh, it does shed light on what the president's state of mind was before the attacks, right? If he doesn't really care about what's happening at the Capitol, it means this was just the, the, the last block in a long chain of blocks on a continuum for the president. First, he tried to win the trial. Uh, I'm sorry, first he tried to win the votes. He didn't win the votes with the, uh, with the people of the United States. Then he tried to challenge it in the courts. He lost on that. Then he tried to pressure state officials. That didn't work. Then he tried to pressure Mike Pence. That didn't work. And then, you know, the last the last step for him was let's let's go and attack the Capitol and stop the counting of the ballots. And then this very last stage is, you know, as the riots are going on, he's still calling his supporters in Congress, trying to get them not to help people get out of the Capitol building, but to slow down the counting of the electoral votes. And he doesn't seem to care that people are, are attacking the Capitol. So this is very important evidence. The other thing that's important for the House managers is that unlike a criminal trial, they have actually gotten some feedback from the jurors themselves. There were several questions yesterday from both Democratic and Republican senators about what you know, what that timeline was, because the thought, the concept that the president was sicking a mob on his own vice president is so horrific to so many of these senators, and it should be to all of the senators, that they want to know more about it. And so the House managers have feedback now that this is something that the Republican senators are also interested in. So those are the two reasons, and I think that they've made the right call in this case. Carol, a lot of folks are trying to figure out what happens next. Uh, if you think that the Senate chamber doors are going to open and Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler is going to waltz in and start testifying like it's the people's court, that's probably not how this is going to play out. What do we think can happen next and how much could this slow down the trial process? Well, it's not Perry Mason. Uh, the, the rules of the impeachment that have been agreed on by both sides is that there will be a, uh, a deposition 
of uh, the Congresswoman. And it's it's not clear exactly what, uh, it's not clear to me, to me at least, what he means by, uh, by Zoom, whether the deposition is by Zoom or whether there will be some sort of live testimony after the deposition by, by Zoom. But it sounds like it's going to be a deposition by Zoom and a deposition uh, means outside the presence of all of the all of the senators. So it would be a brief, uh, you know, it's not going to be a two day deposition. It's going to be an hour, according to uh, House Manager Raskin. And again, he's balancing the pressure he's feeling to move things along quickly uh, and also the need to get the facts out. But this is a very um, contained line of inquiry, right? It's just what did she hear about a phone call? So it should not take a long time, but it does leave open the possibility that what she says might lead to other witnesses and other requests for more witnesses. And it does appear that the uh, Republican side is uh, reserving their right to call witnesses as well. But um, there aren't a lot of witnesses that are available to them who uh, might not cause quite a bit of damage. These people were all victims on that day in, in on January 6th. So uh, they have to be very cautious about who they decide to call as witnesses. Yeah, we've heard Trump's defense team say they'd like to call Nancy Pelosi and the vice president, Kamala Harris. Let's bring in a veteran of the Justice Department and the Mueller investigation, NBC News legal analyst Andrew Weissman. So first of all, this was not maybe what most of us were expecting to see this morning, this call for witnesses. What's your reaction? Are you, are you surprised by this decision? I'm a little surprised just given impeachment one, where there was also a strong uh, case to be made for witnesses. But, you know, here the senators are the victims of, uh, you know, this conduct. So I can understand why they'd want to hear this. Um, I think one thing that's really notable that's also new this morning is the McConnell statement. First, in light of the fact that they're going to hear witnesses or at least one witness, you know, it's McConnell basically has sort of jumped the gun too soon. But even his statement is fascinating because of three things. One, what does he not say? He does not say, I want to acquit or I'm going to vote to acquit because Trump did not incite. Um, there's absolutely no um, defense of that at all. Um, second, um, he says that the answer to the January problem is that um, he can be criminally charged for conduct um, that occurs in January, which is sort of remarkable that he is sort of you know, laying that out there as a possibility. Um, and then finally, he just says, you know, one of the reasons I'm voting to acquit is I think that impeachment is largely about removal. So it's basically on this very procedural point and not at all a defense of what Donald Trump did here. But in essence, and Casey, Casey Hunt is with us. Casey, I believe you have a question. Yeah, uh, Mr. Weissman, uh, thank you so much for being here. And, and to that point, uh, McConnell had control of the Senate timeline while Donald Trump, former President Trump, was still in office and could have started this trial while he was still in office, while Donald Trump was still in office. What are your thoughts on that set of decisions and how it impacts it here? I mean, I think it's a great point that he's now saying, well, the only reason to do this would be to remove him and he's already gone. Yeah, I mean, look, that that is, you know, irony is, you know, alive and well um, in the Capitol. Um, and, you know, I'd say, you know, Mitch McConnell would say we are where we are. Um, and right now he can use that as a point um, to, to basically not have to actually um, align himself with the conduct here. Um, and to me, that is that is fascinating. Um, we actually saw some of that in the first impeachment trial where people really didn't want to approve of the call and the sort of so-called perfect call um, that Donald Trump said it was. And here you can see, you know, um, Mitch McConnell saying there's a way to do this um, where you sort of uphold some of your integrity. And also he clearly is also saying we're going to sort of keep the Senate prerogative because um, he doesn't say that impeachment is solely about removal. Um, so it, it's really a very well-crafted statement um, that 
um, leave the Department of Justice open and the um, states open to consider uh, criminal cases because obviously they could do that anyway. But here you actually have, you know, the you know the former head Republican, the current senior Republican, um, saying that the answer to the January exception is criminal prosecution. Let's bring in Time Magazine contributor and NBC News political contributor Elise Jordan, maybe to talk more about the politics of this. I mean, I can't Elise. Hear Joe. You can't hear Elise? All right. We will we'll try and get that fixed up and then we'll keep uh, checking in with our legal folks. Uh, Andrew, uh, while we have you, I mean, what, as far as we know, we're still sort of learning this process, but what do we expect will happen next? Is this the type of process where if you have a witness, if you're deposing someone, we can get this wrapped up today like so many people were expected? Or could this drag on for several more days based on what we know? My prediction is that this could happen immediately, um, that um, right now um, in the federal court, there are Zoom uh, depositions and Zoom hearings and Zoom trials going on. Um, I won't say all the time, but it is something that people are used to. And taking a quick deposition um, of one witness could actually happen today. Now, it, it's a challenge to get that all done and to proceed to closing arguments in one day. Um, but it really shouldn't be a long time um, to take a short deposition. Um, this is sort of one incident where she's going to be recounting what she was told, uh, presumably by uh, Kevin McCarthy, and she's going to identify what she wrote down uh, reportedly at the time. Carol, does this sort of open up Pandora's box? The defense says, you know, if they do this, I, w- I have at least a, a hundred uh, uh, depositions that I would like in response. Could the defense then try to depose even more and call more witnesses? Could that keep this process going? What, what does this open up if we have this one witness? Uh, theoretically, it opens up uh, a, a Pandora's box, but remember that the Senate can curtail things whenever or however they wish to do that uh, by a simple majority vote. Neither side is is going to push that very hard. And uh, you know, when you candidly, when when the profe- when the president's counsel says we are going to subpoena hundreds of witnesses, that's just not true. Um, it's a, a it's just not true. So. Um, you know, they may want. They may say we're going to depose Nancy Pelosi or, or somebody. It's very doubtful that they would. But even if they did, they could depose them and then decide not to put the um, not to put the evidence in. I think that's a bit of a of a red herring. If you can see how restrained this single request was to depose a single witness, I expect that kind of restraint is going to be um, carried forward by by both. Uh, the House impeachment managers and the president's team. And it will only be if there's a very solid piece of evidence that either side wants to put into evidence. Elise Jordan is back with us, and I believe she can even hear me now. So, Elise, I wanted to talk a little more about the politics of this. I mean, we're all a little surprised by this move, especially with Mitch McConnell now saying that he is going to vote to acquit. Is there really the political will for this? Because let's be honest, this is a political process. Do you think this is a smart move politically to try and move forward with witnesses and perhaps prolong this trial? I think absolutely the American public deserves as much information from primary sources, from witnesses, to what as to what happened that day on January 6th. And so next week, the Senate was going to be out anyway. So this really actually does, this just means that senators are going to have to stick around in Washington and work a little bit more. So it's not like this is going to cut into the Biden's cabinet uh, the hearings to appoint Biden cabinet members. So from that sense, the Democrats really didn't have all that much to lose politically just because this isn't going to dampen President Biden's agenda, which had been the concern of so many Democrats by pursuing the impeachment. And I do think that this plot twist, I'm watching closely because none of us saw this coming. This really was a, a surprise. And so you do wonder 
what information is going to come out. And so will this one deposition lead to subpoenaing subpoenas for other key players who did speak with President Trump that day and have knowledge as to why the Trump, uh, any involvement of the White House in extending the crowd capacity for the rally on January 6th. Key questions like that that we don't know the answers to and the American public deserves to know. I mean, Elise, we do know that the Republicans who at least appear to be undecided, Mitt Romney, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, that their questions that were directed at the attorneys for both sides yesterday were really about this specific issue, about what the president did, what did he know once the insurrection had started. I mean, this issue with getting Congresswoman Herrera Butler to testify really speaks to these questions that it appears they still have, right? Yes, and that uh, you know, really is what Congresswoman Harara Butler did. She had been speaking in news accounts about this earlier, and her tweet and her statement really caught fire last night, and I, you know, alerted everyone to the eyewitness account of Kevin McCarthy calling and pleading with Donald Trump. And also, you've got Senator Tommy Tuberville and his comments about the timeline and about Donald Trump calling him and what did Donald Trump know and when and how that aligns with the tweet schedule of Donald Trump and Donald Trump inciting violence on his own vice vice president. So there are still just so many unanswered questions, and I'm really glad that this isn't going to be as much of a half effort as it seemed like it was going to be with the omission of witnesses. So I hope that this opens up more debate and more information to the American public. Let's bring in Casey Hunt right now. Casey, what's uh, what's on your mind right now? Yeah, you know, Joe, I actually have a question uh, for Elise, because obviously lost in the the chaos of this surprise uh, has been a a sharper focus on what Mitch McConnell has said. We just talked about it from a legal perspective with Andrew Weissman. He made a series of strong points, but I want to know what you think about it from a political perspective, because frankly, if this was proceeding as we had expected, we would all be talking about the fact that Mitch McConnell has come out and said he is prepared to acquit former President Trump based on process grounds, essentially, after the building that he has worked in for so many years was brutalized, attacked, overrun by a mob. After time after time, incident after incident, and I know you and I have have been uh, on, on the air together talking about this for the better part of four years, the question was always, when are they going to finally put their foot down? When are they mm. finally going to tell Donald Trump, no, you can't do this? And it looks like this was their final opportunity, and they are still saying, go ahead. Well, and Casey, I don't know about you, but watching the senator throughout this process, through the aftermath of the January 6th attacks, his posture has been simply fascinating and has had me on the edge of my seat because it seemed like Mitch McConnell had finally just had enough and he was fed up by this horrific attack, this riot incited on this institution that he so treasures. And so for A couple of days there a week, it seemed like Mitch McConnell was venturing out to challenge Donald Trump and to have some accountability for Donald Trump's actions in a way that we really hadn't ever seen before. And then we see the political tides turn and we see how Republicans are still, they still stand with Donald Trump even after that mob was unleashed with them. And so I saw the you know the constitutional question vote. That was just an easy out for Republicans who don't approve of Donald Trump's behavior, but they are scared of the primary voters of the Republican Party and they're scared about being primary in their next election. And so then you have Mitch McConnell today with this statement that I agree with Andrew Weissman. There's just so much subtext in what it doesn't say. And and Mitch McConnell essentially saying that, yes, you know, he could be prosecuted in some other form. It's just not in this forum. And he really wants to wash his hands of it. So Mitch McConnell, at the end of the day, does what he usually always does. He makes a political calculus and goes with it. 
We're now at the top of the hour. You are watching NBC News live coverage of the Senate impeachment trial of Donald J. Trump. And this morning, we've seen unexpected new developments that may change the timeline of this trial. We expected that today we would see the closing arguments by both sides followed by a vote. But after new questions were raised overnight about what then President Trump knew about the severity of the January 6th Capitol assault while it was still underway, the Senate voted this morning to allow the calling of witnesses. And even before that, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell announced that he intended to vote to acquit the former president. So we are in uncharted territory this morning. Casey Hunt, tell us what is happening on the floor right now and what can we anticipate perhaps as this day moves forward? Well, Joe, we're all trying to figure that out together, as you uh, so rightfully point out. We were not expecting what we saw unfold here at the top of this trial. We were expecting this to be the final day of the trial uh, between uh, five, five to seven hours uh, on the floor and then the final vote on conviction or acquittal. And instead, uh, what we just saw, and I'm going to make this even more technical, they have actually voted to have a debate about whether they should call witnesses. Uh, but that reality has thrown everything uh, in, into chaos. And Senator Bill Cassidy uh, was just talking with uh, some of my colleagues who are over in the Capitol. And uh, he said that Richard Shelby, who is uh, a Republican who's been around here a long time, said he's been here for three impeachment trials, and this one is by far the craziest. And the reality is these are normally pretty choreographed and, and carefully scripted. And the House managers, instead of coming up and making their final arguments, they said, no, we want to call uh, Jamie Herrera Butler, who is a congresswoman uh, from Washington state. She's a Republican who voted to impeach Donald Trump to tell, uh, to tell the, the trial more about what she knows about a call between Kevin McCarthy, the House Minority Leader, and Donald Trump on the day of the January 6th attack. And of course, it's a question of whether there are, we knew that the call had happened. Uh, the, there were uh, leaks in, in, the, in the immediate aftermath that McCarthy had called uh, Trump and was angry about what had happened. Uh, but this new set of details that uh, Herrera Butler is offering suggests that the president was more aware than perhaps we knew uh, about what was happening, how bad it was, and how much danger Republicans and Democrats alike were in as this mob overran the Capitol. So right now, what you're seeing on the floor is the same thing that you and I are doing, basically. Senators are trying to figure out what's going on and what happens next. And you've seen uh, Mitch McConnell is down there in a huddle with other members of his conference, John Cornyn, uh, Joni Ernst, uh, it looks like Dan Sullivan of Alaska, Mike Braun there at the front of your screen uh, as they are speaking with what look like Senate floor staffers. This is all very technical and complicated, and the Senate runs on this, this very sort of arcane set of rules, especially under uh, an impeachment trial situation like this. So we are waiting to see what is going to happen next. The, the House manager, Jamie Raskin, suggested that they could potentially still do this quickly. He suggested a one-hour Zoom deposition uh, that could potentially happen today, uh, and then they could return to those final arguments. Now, that, in theory, could meet everyone's desire to get out of here quickly. Democrats to move on to Joe Biden's, uh, President Joe Biden's agenda. Republicans to put this episode behind them and, and move to a vote. Clearly Mitch McConnell, uh, in writing a, a letter to his colleagues this morning, believed that we were on track for that. He was ready to say, I want to vote to acquit uh, President Trump. But now all this has been thrown into limbo. So uh, there is a big question about what Herrera Butler herself would be willing to do. Has she spoken with the House impeachment managers? Did that happen last night ahead of this? Are they aware that she would quickly say yes and that they would be able uh, to do this deposition right away and move expeditiously? It certainly sounded like perhaps that was the case, but those are some of the threads that we're reporting out right now. Uh, because obviously if she tried to fight the subpoena, that could take days or weeks to resolve. And that's something that everyone's been trying to avoid, Joe. Casey, we this is obviously a surprise for everyone, in part because especially with McConnell coming out and saying he's going to quit, we know the odds of getting 17 Republicans are slim to none. So what might we think is the strategy or the reason that Jamie Raskin and the House impeachment managers would want to call these witnesses, knowing that they're still probably not going to get the conviction that they want? So that's, that's an interesting question, Joe. And the sense that I was getting last night was that there was pressure building, uh, particularly from progressives, opponents of, of Donald Trump, who were animated by not just the January 6th riot, but so many other things that happened throughout his administration, 
Uh, and they were starting to put pressure on some of the Democratic senators to make sure that they were out there demonstrating that they had done everything they could to try and convict former President Trump. And when this uh, it was a CNN uh, story that was a write-up of uh, Herrera Butler's comments. She had actually made some similar comments to uh, a local town hall that was covered by a local paper uh, a week or so ago. Uh, but these new details suddenly were thrust uh, into the, the conversation and into the public eye uh, on Twitter uh, and other, other places. So uh, I think that there was a demand from uh, the Democratic base, frankly, pressure on, on Democratic senators to say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and, and try and do this. We need to find out more information. Now, a, a couple things. First, we know that those there were five Republicans who went and voted with Democrats to say, okay, we want to hear more about this. Lindsey Graham was one of them. I'm going to set him aside. We know where he stands on Trump. But the other four were possibly going to vote to convict President Trump. The fact that none of the other Republicans voted uh, to uh, move forward on witnesses reflects, I think, where the acquittal and conviction vote stands right now. And in some ways, the fact that McConnell put out this statement when he did makes your question all the more critical because McConnell's not out there saying something could happen on this floor that would change my mind. He is saying, I don't think we have the jurisdiction to deal with this. Uh, and he's not dealing with the underlying facts of the case at all. And that tells you, and, and, and the big question I think that we had before that McConnell letter was, was there something that was going to come out? Was there new information that would make it impossible uh, for these senators to vote to acquit Donald Trump? Would there be a group of five or so more that would say, you know what, I just can't do it? And we have the answer to that question and the argument in which it's going to come. And it's pretty clear that no matter what else we learned, uh, the political realities uh, would stay the same. So uh, it's a little bit of a squeeze here, these sort of two separate pieces of news breaking at the same time. Uh, and all sides trying to digest and change course based on that. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell. She covers Biden world. She's covered Trump world. And of course, she spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. Let's dig a little deeper into this Lindsey Graham, which is perhaps the most surprising senator to vote for the witnesses. Uh, you've covered him for years. What do you make of that vote? Was that surprising? Well, one of the issues when you have a Senate vote is they always hold open the possibility at the end of the vote for any senators who wish to change their vote. And there are times when a strategic change brings forth that kind of a moment. We didn't know it was coming, but it makes sense in this context. There's been no more vocal senator trying to defend former President Trump and to try to talk about ways to heal the divisions in the Republican Party going forward and how to do that amid all this debris and chaos. So for Lindsey Graham, who has been effectively in the room with the Trump defense team for extended periods of time, his saying yes to witnesses when it was clear there were already enough votes with the others who had stepped forward allows the defense team to say it has embraced the idea of witnesses, a very different group of witnesses, a very different agenda and strategy from a legal standpoint. But if they had not done that, if they didn't have someone from their side, if I can use that term, it would make it harder for them to be persuasive to say because the, the who gets called would be a, a matter of a vote and to demonstrate that they want to participate in witnesses, to not simply let the House managers have a witness of their choice without preserving their rights to do it too. So in that sense, it is a strategic move and it is surprising, of course, because it extends this day and it opens up some of the question marks that we've been talking about. And so if people are concerned about what happens next, none of us really know. And that makes for interesting and rare uh, circumstances on Capitol Hill. That's the nature of an impeachment trial. The speed that people wanted to have this dispatched with seems to have been put on pause. And one of the issues when Casey talked about, and she's so right about how these phone calls were known, but they bubbled up in a new way last night, in part it's social media, in part it's additional reporting, and in part, it's the facts that were presented in the trial where counsel for President Trump had asserted to the senators who are jurors that he did not know there was danger to Vice President Mike Pence. He did not know of the uh, degree of the threat of physical harm to lawmakers and others. 
Well, the the uh, the phone call certainly is evidence that that is not the case. Uh, and it's evidence from Republicans, whether it's Tommy Tuberville, the senator from Alabama who had his own phone call, or whether it is uh, the congresswoman from Washington state, an ally of Kevin McCarthy, who was briefed by Kevin McCarthy to know what the substance of his conversation was. Everyone also can remember that Kevin McCarthy, in the hours after all of this happened, was in a very different place than he's been most recently, where he said President Trump bore some responsibility for what took place. He has backed off of that considerably. But that goes to his state of mind that day, too, and seems to corroborate a frustrated, angry Kevin McCarthy who had spoken to the president on that call. So all of this playing out in the kind of detail that is giving us, uh, dare I say it, a Perry Mason moment. Uh, I'm showing my age there to even make that reference, Joe, but you can appreciate it, I'm sure, that we didn't think this was going to happen, and here it has. So big questions ahead. How much time will it take? Who will be called? What will happen? But the fact that senators are saying there is more worth knowing here, and it goes specifically to the state of mind of the former president, uh, is very noteworthy. Now, in the time that we have been talking here, We've learned from the Biden White House uh, that they wanted it to be known that President Biden, who is at Camp David, his first time there since taking office, uh, is, of course, spending time with family. It's a combination holiday weekend of Valentine's Day and President's Day weekend. But they've also told us that he is meeting with his national security team today. That sort of hammers home the doing his job message, which is something we've seen lots of top officials in the Biden White House and the president himself talk about, that there may be a lot of attention happening down at the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue, question marks, unknowns, a real drama happening, but they are trying to project uh, that the, uh, the hand is on the till and that President Biden is uh, at work uh, governing uh, while there is an impeachment and uh, all of the political theater and the important issues for history that are being dealt with uh, on Capitol Hill. Joe? Kelly, it's a Perry Mason moment, but one with a modern twist because we might have a deposition on Zoom. Well, let's bring in former U.S. attorney and senior FBI official and an NBC News contributor Chuck Rosenberg. Uh, Chuck, I guess we just want to get your reaction to these developments this morning. I think I heard you earlier today before we knew that the impeachment managers were going to call witnesses, and, and I think it was something you maybe weren't expecting or maybe didn't think was necessary now that it's happened. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think what I said earlier, Joe, was that there was sort of a, a small, minimal, marginal benefit to calling witnesses. But that's only true in the following sense. What Elise Jordan said earlier uh, is very important and quite accurate. If you're calling witnesses to supplement the record, to have a more fulsome history of what happened, there is a value to it. If you're calling witnesses, and this is what I was referring to, because you think it might change some votes, I think that's highly unlikely. And so, and so there really is a minimal benefit if that's your goal. But as a former federal prosecutor, look, more evidence is good. Uh, and the more evidence you have, the better the record. And that, again, goes to Elise's point. Remember yesterday when um, we started the question and answer phase uh, in the impeachment trial? And I think, if not the first question, one of the first questions came from Senators Collins and Murkowski, and it was directed to the defense team. And they asked, when did the president learn of the violence? What did he do about it? And when did he do it? An incredibly important question. Uh, and they got absolutely no response. In fact, what they got in response was insulting. Uh, I believe it was Van Der Veen, one of the defense counsel, who said, there was no investigation, we have no evidence, there's no answer to your question, and by the way, there's a whole bunch of due process violations. The answer was utter nonsense. Uh, who could investigate what actually happened after the violence started and what the president thought of it when he learned it and what he did about it? That would be Michael Van Der Veen his lawyer. How could he learn that, Joe? By asking his client, Donald Trump. If he didn't bother to do that, that's on him. And if he did do it, and the answers would have been helpful to Donald Trump, we would have heard about that. And so going back to the question that Collins and Murkowski asked, when did the president learn of the violence? What did he do about it? When did he do it? And the fact that they didn't get an answer more evidence is better. Again, I don't think it's going to change any votes. But if we're going to supplement the historical record, 
if we're going to have a better picture of the events of January 6th and what happened both before and after the riot, sure, then why not? Let's hear from witnesses. Will it change the outcome? Highly unlikely. Chuck, why just call Congresswoman Herrera Butler? Do you think that they should be calling Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, that Senator Tuberville, who is going to be voting on this, should testify as well? I mean, is it just one or, or does this open the door to the fact that we should hear from more witnesses? Yeah, you know, Joe, it's a good question for a dime and for a dollar. I mean, again, if what we care about is supplementing the record or making as full a record as possible, then maybe more witnesses make sense. You know, when I was a federal prosecutor and we tried cases in real court, and this is sort of a fake trial in a fake court, um, you would call witnesses because the jurors didn't know anything about the case, right? It's not like they had lived through it. In fact, if a juror had been a victim, then they wouldn't be a juror. They wouldn't be on the jury. Uh, that's not the case here. And so, you know, in this trial, and I sort of put that in air quotes, uh, in this trial, the jurors know pretty much everything that has happened. Uh, and so it, you would be calling additional witnesses to supplement the historical record. Again, to Elise Jordan's point, I think there is value in that. And to your question, Joe, then sure, you could call additional witnesses. I don't think it takes that long. Um, Andrew Weissman made the point earlier, and he's right. These are discrete events. It's a phone call. It's not something that took place over days or weeks or months. It's a phone call. And by the way, you don't even have to do a deposition. Both parties, the defense team and the prosecution team, could simply stipulate to what happened. That means you sit down with the witness, you ask him or her what they know, you write it up, and both sides agree that if called, Congresswoman um, Herrera Butler would testify as follows, and you have a stipulated historical record. That would be even faster than a deposition. It shouldn't take that long. It shouldn't incur great delay. And you could also get through more witnesses in that way relatively quickly. So again, if the goal is to supplement the record, more is better. If your goal is to change votes, highly unlikely. Hey, Chuck, it's Casey Hunt uh, on Capitol Hill. Um, can I just ask you, and I realize, uh, as you pointed out, you've uh, tried and focused on cases in real court and the rules here uh, are quite different. But if, in fact, there were to be a number of witnesses called, and it sounds like right now the discussion behind the scenes may be that if Democrats are going to get a witness, Republicans may also want one or perhaps more uh, witnesses. So they're trying to work that out right now. What would happen if there was a subpoena that went out to a witness who refused to testify, for example? I mean, does that fight drag out uh, for weeks or months? I mean, how do you even adjudicate something like that? Yeah, that's a great question, Casey. So in theory, uh, yes, someone could contest the subpoena and you might have to go to court to enforce it. I would hope that if members of Congress are receiving subpoenas, that they would honor that and they would try to be of assistance to this tribunal. So you do have the problem of people who don't want to testify, uh, either contesting it in court or invoking some sort of privilege that would preclude their testimony. I'd like to think that wouldn't happen with members of Congress. I would like to think that they had a higher duty, a higher calling here, and they would try and help this tribunal get to a resolution. But you raise a really good question because, you know, when we talk about doing this thing quickly, whether it's by deposition or by stipulation, that's in the ideal world. The Senate these days doesn't seem to be able to do anything particularly quickly or efficiently. And, you know, if the question is, could this drag out further? The answer is you bet it could. Chuck, I had a question for you. Michael Vanderveen, Trump's attorney, says, well, this is the irrelevant stuff. He says it doesn't matter what happened after the insurgency started because it wasn't about incitement. Clearly, there are some lawmakers, when we listen to their questions yesterday, who, who feel very differently about that, right? Yeah, Joe, absolutely. Let's say I rob a bank. And you're investigating me, right? Special Agent Joe Fryer, which actually sounds like a cool FBI name, is, in, is uh, investigating that bank robbery. And after the bank robbery, uh, I hide the money, right? Or I throw away my gun, or I burn the getaway car, or I tell witnesses that they better not cooperate with Special Agent Fryer, because if they do, bad things are going to happen to them. Is that stuff relevant 
to the fact that I robbed a bank? You bet it is. Of course it is. And that's such an easy question because it goes to proof of my involvement, my intent, right? Maybe the yeah. MO. It's really important stuff. And so what Vanderveen is saying, what he is claiming, that stuff that happened after the riot is not relevant, is not material. Let me tell you what the legal word is for that, Joe. It's utter nonsense. It's garbage. He should know better. Or perhaps he doesn't. One of two things are possible. He knows better and he's misleading the tribunal or he has absolutely no idea what he's talking about. Chuck, we appreciate your expertise so much. Standing by for us right now is one of the senators hearing this case, Democrat Jeff Merkley of Oregon. Senator, we know that earlier today before the session went back into session at 10 o'clock this morning, you were one of those who said you wanted to hear from witnesses that is apparently going to happen now. What, what is your reaction to this news that, that the Senate plans to move forward with witnesses? I think it's a tremendous development because any fair trial enables uh, both the prosecuting attorneys and the defense to call relevant individuals and provide information that bears on the case. And I deeply believe that many senators really want to understand better what happened when close friends of Trump said to him, you know what, you need to call this off. You need to stop those folks from, from going down there and trashing the Capitol. You need to get them out of the Capitol. And he refused to, to act, apparently. Well, that information will be very useful. Knowing what that conversation was with Kevin McCarthy will be very useful. Meanwhile, if the defense wants to talk to Nancy Pelosi, well, so be it. She's going to tell exactly what happened when, when uh, the mob stormed the Capitol. Um, do you think behind the scenes here, it sounds to me like you're saying you may be willing to vote in favor of allowing the defense to call uh, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, what's being talked about behind the scenes in terms of how to work out an agreement? Would we see votes on individual witnesses? Would this be a free for all? Or is there an effort to try and choreograph this? Every idea is on the table right now. It's, it's kind of the wild, wild west here. Uh, I. I personally would like to see each side get a certain number of witnesses and let them choose who they think is, is relevant to depose. If that's five aside, 10 aside, obviously this should not turn into a circus where somebody says, I got to interview a thousand people or, or so on and so forth. But if, if one side gets five witnesses, the other side should get five witnesses. They should be able to choose who they, who, who they want. That seems like the fairest way to proceed. Senator Merkley, we have Bruce Castor telling reporters that they would, if they can, call lots of witnesses. Do you worry that this opens the door to stretching out this process for a very, very long time and in the end won't change the result anyway? Well, Bruce noted uh, before us uh, that he wanted to interview uh, everyone who was under uh, indictment for having committed crimes inside the Capitol. Well, what are those folks going to say? They're going to say, well, we came because Trump sent us, because they've already said that. Uh, I Clearly, uh, his goal would be to uh, intimidate the House managers from calling anyone at all, saying we're going to turn this into a circus, we're going to interview 100 people, uh, and so forth. Uh, that clearly does not serve the public purpose of getting to the truth. But an equal number of witnesses per side, that would be fair. Senator Merkley, uh, it's Casey again. Can we? Uh, can I ask you about the, the letter that Mitch McConnell sent to his colleagues this morning? What bearing do you think that had on the House manager's decision to call witnesses? And does it tell you that this witness process is uh, perhaps not going to change any outcomes? You know, I think the conversation over witnesses was really triggered by the news last night about the conversation Kevin McCarthy had with the president. The fact that got into a, a yelling match. The fact that Kevin McCarthy was saying, stop this assault on the Capitol. And apparently, reportedly, uh, the president wasn't interested in doing so. Which really affirms other conversations we've heard about, but we don't have firsthand testimony on. And I think that firsthand testimony uh, is what would be very valuable in this case. Senator Merkley, what is the end game here? What is it that you and Democrats hope to get out of this, knowing that getting the conviction is going to be very difficult at this point? You know, I know a bunch of my Republican colleagues feel like their base uh, has not uh, heard, if you will, uh, the 
extent of what, how the president did this, how, how he basically told a big lie, how he he fueled their fury over 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 months of uh, of meetings, how he led to reschedule them to come on the day directly to interfere with the vote, how he sent them to the Capitol, how he failed to call the National Guard, how he failed to respond to those who asked him to call this attack off. I think that for all of America, that information, for every American to hear firsthand from people who were involved in those moments would be very important to America going forward together. It'd also be very important to my colleagues saying, now with this additional information, uh, we can no longer turn our head. And if, the, if their base has heard this information, it's easier for them to say, now you've heard what I've heard. I need to, to hold a, the president accountable if, if indeed I believe that he did these things uh, with this additional testimony. Senator, would you like to see Kevin McCarthy testify as well? I would. But I, my philosophy is that whether he is called or other people are called should be up uh, to the House managers and to the defense attorneys. Uh, Senator, quickly on the timeline here, I know you said that it's the Wild West, but clearly uh, Manager Raskin suggested he would want this to move quickly. Is there a sense that you'd still want to keep this to this weekend, that you could contain uh, what you need to hear from these witnesses to a, a shortened timeline, especially considering that President Biden wants to move on to try and passing, pass his COVID relief plan? So my first instinct was that depositions, if there are five per side or 10 per side, are going to take a couple weeks uh, to schedule to, to hold them, prepare, and, and come back. And so they would essentially suspend the, the trial for a couple weeks. They could, however, say, we want one witness. You get one witness. Uh, let's, uh, let's get them deposed tomorrow. Let's come back. I don't know if they can compel the deposition that quickly. Are individuals going to file lawsuits saying that they can't be held? Is it going to have to work its way through the courts? I'm not a lawyer. I don't know, but there's ways that this could get bogged down. So it may be that they're wrestling with whether one one per side and let's do this quick, or we need a week or two to, to do these depositions right and then call the Senate back together so the Senate can work in the intervening time on the very important issue of accelerating uh, reconciliation, the effort to get aid to Americans and make sure we get it done by March 14th. Senator Jeff Merkley, Democrat from Oregon, thanks so much for joining us as we follow these huge developments. Right now, we want to bring in NBC News political director and moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, who joins us. Chuck, we can throw every metaphor imaginable at this, a curveball, an audible. Right. Uh, what would you call it, and what's your reaction to what we're seeing here this morning? Well, the only thing I keep going through my head is um, and wondering what, how the morning would have played out, Joe, would have been if Mitch McConnell had let, uh, had given word that he was going to vote to convict rather than acquit. Um, would, that have, um, would that have changed the uh, discussion today? Would that have changed the decision-making process on that? Um, who knows? Uh, look, clearly the pivotal moment was last night when Congresswoman Butler put out that statement. And the very end, and, and it's my understanding, I've sources that have um, underscored to me that was a very intentional thing to do last night, essentially to send the bat signal that, yes, call witnesses. Um, it's, it's my understanding that the Congresswoman has uh, a very detailed account of everything that went on uh, and, of her, and has her recollection, uh, uh, not just, not ju it's not going to just be remembering things, um, that she is going to be a very very um, good fact witness here um, when all is said and done. So th this is, I think that had more of an impact on Jamie Raskin and the House managers than perhaps Mitch McConnell. But I'll be honest, I can't help but wonder that um, a little bit um, uh, uh, there, Joe. Chuck, I asked Senator Merkley, what's the end game here? Based on what you're seeing for Democrats in the House impeachment mm -hmm. managers, what do you think is their end game here? Why, why do this if they don't think they can get those 17 Republican votes? Well, I think they think maybe they can. I mean, let's it uh, look, there's clearly a motivation of, of these, particularly the House Republicans that voted to impeach. They want the record. All, they want this all on the record before the end of this trial. You know, um, I don't, you know, nobody wants to see these deathbed conversions of saying, well, if only I known about 
when we get when more of this story comes out, which inevitably it will, you know, the House of Representatives is controlled by the Democrats. They will investigate th this themselves. Um, so the record will come out and you don't want that excuse of, oh, well, if only all of this had been on the record, then maybe I would have voted differently, you know, as somebody uh, tries to create a political deathbed conversion here. So I think that that I think that has that has some motive here for at least the, those House Republicans that voted to impeach to, like, get this all on the record. And I think it's going to be one and one. You know, they'll end up agreeing. You know, I, I don't I think while there might be some senators like a Rand Paul or Mike Lee that want to troll this process, ultimately they'll 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 be in agreement of probably one witness from each side. And probably this will all come to a resolution in the, in, a, in about a week. Is, does a week seem like too long? We know that we were expecting that we'd maybe get the vote this afternoon. We know that the Biden administration wants to wrap this up as quickly as possible to keep the focus on COVID relief. The country might be ready to move on. If it goes several more days or a week, is that going to be too much? Or, or at the end of the day, do folks just not care at this point? Well, I, look, if, I think another week isn't that big of a deal in hindsight. I know in our, in our 24 second news cycle. Um, we, we think, oh my God, a week seems like a lifetime. Um, the Senate was going to be out anyway. This was a holiday. You know, the way that Congress works when there is, when the rest of America gets a day off, they take a week, sometimes two uh, weeks. So they were already going to take this upcoming week off. So this really doesn't mess up the Senate schedule. If you're thinking about the COVID relief bill, the work is still being done in the House right now. There is not a lot of work for the Senate to be doing. So I think if it's if this drug dragged on for more than a week, I think you'd start to hear um, hand wringing from some Democrats and some Biden folks. But one week, I don't think so. Kelly O'Donnell, you're at the White House. Do we have any idea at this point how the White House and how the Biden administration feels if we do have a few more days of this trial? Well, they're not giving us a sort of minute by minute assessment, but they are sending us signals. In particular, they're saying they're not coordinating with the Democrats who are in charge, the House managers and so forth, or individual senators on how they might vote. Again, that doesn't mean they aren't aware of it, doesn't mean they're not informed. We're told the vice president, who is temporarily living just a stone's throw from where I'm standing right now at Blair House, while repairs are being done, maintenance repairs to the official residence of the vice president. She is here and her aides are saying she's working today and is aware of what's happening on Capitol Hill. Uh, but this is something where the the message coming from the Biden White House, from the president on down, has been about trying to focus on their own policy aims. For example, he is at Camp David right now, his first weekend there since taking office. And while there's time for family and enjoying what is an extended holiday weekend, they were careful to let us know that he is meeting with national security officials who made the trip to Camp David with him uh, today. So the president is doing that work. Again, it's a signal to say he is doing the job of governing. He is occupying the office he now holds and is not affected by what's happening with impeachment. At the same time, with all of the questions that you've been laying out and the suppositions we're making and the blanks that we're trying to fill, certainly a protracted Trump impeachment is not good for the Biden agenda. It doesn't mean it's not politically uh, good in terms of comparison, in terms of trying to speak to the progressive side of the Democratic Party that wants this level of accountability uh, more broadly than that, but certainly the animated and energized progressive side. But anytime you've got effectively the shadow of one president over a current president who's just getting started, there's lots of political challenges to that. It also means that people like me and my colleagues are asking about impeachment on a regular basis. We're asking the president. So you might be able to see over my shoulder this art display that the current first lady, Jill Biden, put in here on the North Lawn for Valentine's Day with lots of messages that is her Valentine to the country talk of gratitude and hope and courage. Well, the president and first lady came out to see this with their morning coffee early yesterday. And the president being within striking distance of a few reporters after the niceties about the holiday setup, of course, he was asked about impeachment. 
So that will continue for as long as the trial remains uh, an open question. And that is something that President Biden understands. He was in the Senate for a long time. He's been asked how he would vote if still a senator. He demurs on all of that and says that's not the role he plays now. He has expressed that some of the video that was played, which included some new security video that the public had not seen, certainly officials had seen it, may have had an impact, might change some minds. He expressed being concerned about what would the senators do, that he's, he is waiting like everyone else to know what their decision will be. But beyond that, certainly the Biden team is trying to say they're not thinking about Donald Trump. They're not thinking about impeachment. They have such a big job to do uh, that that's where their focus is. So we are monitoring for blips in the force field uh, of any change along those lines. Uh, but unlike the former president, who would let us know his thought process on Twitter almost moment by moment. We don't have that kind of window into Joe Biden. We can look at what he says, what he does, and knowing him over years and covering him over years. Uh, but we're not getting sort of the pulse minute by minute from this White House that we grew accustomed to in the Trump years. Now, on the Trump side, our colleagues who are stationed uh, for uh, what we're calling the bonus trip to Palm Beach uh, are saying they've seen that President Trump has gone to his golf club, or at least the motorcade uh, for President Trump has gone there today. And he may be on the phone with his lawyers. He may be uh, doing some of those things. When he goes to the golf club, in addition to playing golf, which he does all the time, uh, he does use the offices and facilities at his clubs for meetings and the like. So that's a possibility as well, uh, as we're trying to still follow uh, the Trump uh, situation as we're now covering a new White House. Joe? I think Casey's going to jump in with a quick question for you. Uh, hey, Joe, and yeah, actually, Chuck, I wanted to follow up with you on, on something you were just uh, talking about and, and kind of pull on some of these threads related uh, to uh, Congresswoman Butler's statement last night, and in particular that last line where she was, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a statement like that before from a member of Congress, and you know, we've, seen, we've yeah. seen thousands of them, where she said, if you have more information, now would be the time to come forward. I mean, there's a suggestion that there's more there, and I'm wondering, do you think that was directed, who do you think it was directed at, and do you think it was directed in part at McConnell? Because at, when, this, when this went out, we didn't know where he stood. I don't know if it was directed at McConnell. Look, it's my, I, I, could, I could tell you this. There, there, the, it's my understanding, certainly the House Republicans that voted to impeach, um, they've, they're, they're their own caucus now. And in some ways, they're, you know, they're, they're, they don't have many allies other than themselves. So, um, but they know some of them have some first and secondhand accounts and certainly know our direct witnesses to others that have firsthand accounts. So I think it's we're talking about more like people like Kevin McCarthy, uh, more like people like Mark Meadows, um, the folks that were in conversation at the time. And so it's and it, frankly, I think this was also um, putting in the public record, sending a message to the House managers that there are more people that have information hint, hint, call witnesses. And she put out a statement last night and, you know, she doesn't say I'm willing to testify. It's the only thing that's missing in the statement, but it's pretty clear she's willing to testify. So this is certainly right. not going to be a subpoena she decides to fight. Yeah. So, Chuck, I mean, the content of McConnell's statement saying basically, I'm going to vote to acquit and it's because of the process. It's because the role is mm -hmm. to remove. He doesn't address the substance of any of this. Do you think there's any reason no, to didn't. believe that more substance of this coming out would sway enough minds? Well, that's the question. I mean, you know, you've you've heard from Mitch McConnell has stated definitively, it seems that he believes they don't have jurisdiction. Mike Rounds said the same thing, right? Here he was reacting in an, almost in the affirmative to Ted Lieu saying, it's not Donald Trump running and winning that I'm worried about, it's him running again and losing. Totally. And him saying, yeah, a lot of us wrote that down. Um, I, I don't know if they're really going to get stuck in this jurisdiction argument, which, you know, it's interesting. It, it, it is, there is not a jurisdictional argument. 
Um, this followed the letter of the Constitution. Okay, right word for word. It is up to the Senate to decide its jurisdiction and impeachment trials, and they made this decision. So you only have you only use that as an excuse if you don't want to say how you'd vote. And I think that's the uncomfortable nature of this. And perhaps witnesses um, uh, force, you know, make this vote even harder. Again, I think what the House managers have always believed is that the Mike, leaving Mike Pence, I mean, to use a phrase here, hanging out to dry. And it was unfortunate that it was, there were people there actually chanting and wanting to hang him. I think they've always believed that was the best argument they had to find 17 Republican votes. So, uh, Chuck, we're getting um, our team up here on the Hill um, just saw Jason Miller walking by the cameras and uh, there are pictures of the witness list he was holding. It says Nancy Pelosi, number one, VP Kamala Harris, number two, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, number three, number four, Aaron Schaff. She's a New York Times photographer. Muriel Bowser, uh, number five. Uh, what do you make uh, of this list? Does it seem like the Trump defense is at all prepared for what's about to happen yeah. next? I think this is I think um, they're all showing their ignorance of this process. I mean, this is what happens when you don't have a single person that has any experience on any sort of election law or impeachment process. You know, firing the South Carolina lawyer, Mr. Bowers, who had some experience working with both Mark Sanford and I think actually was Pat McCrory's lawyer uh, as well. Uh, he was pretty knowledgeable. Um, and so uh, I, the former president right now has, you know, has a has a legal team that is cl does not know what they're doing there are right now. Underway, and uh, so I ask they're... unanimous consent. The Senate recess until 12:30 p.m. Is there objection? Is there objection? Hearing none, we stand in recess till 12:30. Thank you, Mr. President. All right, we just heard right there that Chuck Schumer wants the Senate to recess for the next 45 minutes or so until 1230. Not much has happened, obviously, in the last hour and a half. What we know is that the Senate does want to move forward with calling at least one witness. So we're not going to hear the closing arguments yet this morning. It's unclear if we'll even get to a vote later today. That seems more and more unlikely as we wait to see how this process moves forward. But the Senate is now in recess. We were expecting to maybe be wrapping up right now with the closing argument from the House impeachment impeachment managers, and then maybe waiting for the defense, President Trump's lawyers, to also do that. Let's bring in right now Senator Maisie Hirono, Democrat of Hawaii, joins us now to talk more about all these surprising developments this morning. Senator, good to have you with us. So first of all, your reaction to this move now to have witnesses instead of just moving forward with the closing arguments and with the final vote today, this could delay the process a few days. Do you think that's going to happen? Do you think this is the right move? It was a, a determination by the House managers to call at least this one witness, and it, it was a decision that a lot of us, all of us, I did, uh, left to them uh, if they thought it was uh, necessary. And so they made the decision. I'm supporting it. What do you think are the benefits of calling or listening to testimony from Congresswoman Herrera Butler? And are there others that you would like to hear from as uh, witnesses? She can testify directly to her statement that Kevin McCarthy had called the president in the midst of the insurrection murderous riot and um, testify that that McCarthy pleaded with the president to put a stop to it because he believed that the president was the person who could do it. So that certainly plays to the, the president's awareness and uh, the power he had to put a stop to it. So she can testify to that. As far as uh, um, <laughs> other witnesses, you know, I would like to hear from President Trump, frankly, and I know that the House managers had invited him to testify. He is the central person in this entire <laughs> thing, <laughs> process, and uh, he declined. I'd like to hear from him under oath. Besides President Trump, are there other witnesses you'd like to hear from? Do you want to hear from Kevin McCarthy in this trial? 
I'd like to hear from the person who uh, he um, talked to, uh, contemporaneous to the phone call. I'd like to hear from the people who were with the president during the, the time that he was watching what was going on in, in the White House. He was watching from the White House. So that there are a number of those kinds of witnesses, as long as we're going to be calling witnesses. But the president's lawyers threatening to call 100 witnesses, I, you know, it's very clear that he was basically stomping his feet to play to the president. That is not real. So if we're going to come down to relevant, appropriate witnesses, I hope that's the kind of discussion and um, negotiation that's happening between the two lawyers. Senator Hirono, uh, it's Casey Hunt here on the Hill. Uh, can I ask you the right, what is the balance and the thinking around how to deal with this trial in the context of the current president's agenda? Because there had been a lot of pressure in both parties, frankly, to wrap this up quickly. And this obviously potentially extends the process. Are we looking at weeks more of dealing with this while we talk about these new sets of facts? Are we talking about days? How do people want to handle it? As far as I understand, while uh, there may need to be some time uh, spent deposing the witnesses, and there will be, I'm sure, a, an agreement on the limit uh, of the number of witnesses, and, and the Senate will have to vote on whether or not to enable those witnesses to be brought forth. We will continue the work that needs to happen. The, the other work that has to do with the, the Biden agenda, and that has to do principally right now with COVID relief. And is, is the president and his team weighing in behind the scenes in terms of how they want these witnesses to play out? I doubt it because uh, the president has uh, been continuously focused on getting control of this pandemic and the economic recovery that needs to follow. So I would expect that he would continue to leave it to the a Senate impeachment process to play out. Senator Maisie Hirono, Democrat from Hawaii, thank you so much for joining us this morning in reaction to this news developing. The curveball that was thrown, instead of hearing closing arguments, we now know that the Senate is going to have witnesses, at least one witness, which may elongate this process. Again, the Senate is now in recess as it considers how to proceed on the question of calling witnesses. We will be back with live coverage of the impeachment trial just as soon as the Senate convenes, reconvenes at 1230. For now, I'm Joe Fryer, NBC News. Start today. Let's go 2021. Kicking off the new year strong. It's time to take care of you with healthy foods, fitness. You're incredible. And how to jumpstart your love life. Cupid is winning. So join us and start today. Make no mistake, what happened that day was an insurrection against the United States government. Is this the beginning of something or the end of something? Should Donald Trump be ostracized from the Republican Party as you know it? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The deadly siege on Congress. Lawmakers move to safe locations. There's two more weeks left in this presidency. Where is this going? Despite what we've been through, there will be a transfer of power at the U.S. Capitol. NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. You're watching NBC News Now. We've got some breaking news. But we actually saw a large convoy of the National Guard come through here. It's news made for your streaming world. Live weekdays starting at 6 a.m. Eastern.
for breaking news in our changing world. Download the NBC News app. We are a country of laws, a democracy built on free and fair elections, where the majority, not the mob, rules. And no rioter, no act of insurrection or domestic terror, no desperate despot can take away all we have built, all that we stand for, and all we hold dear. He wasn't my biological child, but my heart. You can't tell that to my heart. I love that boy. It's not fair that he was taken from his children or from his family. Jesse fell for Vince, a man in uniform, holding the fort during his long deployments. My hat goes off to all military wives. It's not easy. It's not. She was a good mom. She loved the kids. Reunited at last, they celebrated. Then, on the drive home. There was a car there, stranded. Vince tells his wife that he's going to go check on him. I heard two, three popping zones. He was laying there with what appeared to be several gunshot wounds to the head. Her husband, a father of five, dead. <laughs> No one could understand it. The type of person that he was, I don't think he ever had an enemy. Or did he? He said, we are now in debt to bad people. We knew that there was another person that needed to be looked at. A winding investigation leading deep into the dark. This sounds like a love triangle. I believe it was. Terrific. Brutal. I was like, why? Are you kidding me? I'm Lester Holt, and this is Dateline. Here's Andrea Canning with Evil Was Waiting. Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Cornfields, picket fences, and patriotism. Just to the south is Fort Campbell home to more than 13,000 Army soldiers and their families. After facing danger all over the world, soldiers return to a collective sigh of relief. After all, bad things aren't supposed to happen here. But when one young sergeant returned from a tour in Afghanistan, he had no idea the enemy would be much closer to home. My husband got out to see if some guy needed help. Multiple gunshots to his face and head. He had only been back from fighting in the war for such a short period of time. It was tragic. My heart sunk. <laughs> Sergeant Vincent Goslin Jr., a 28-year-old father of five, had served in the Army for seven years as a quartermaster and mechanic. Did Vince ever express to you what it meant to him to serve his country. He absolutely loved it. Tim Hamilton is Vince's cousin, but as he explains it, they were much more than that. Were you kind of like a big brother to Vince? Yeah, with him it was, I don't know how, we had a bond. He had an outgoing personality. He had his crazy little grin 